there we go Justin Rowe is joining that's good you know imagine like Justin doesn't show up I got some goodies too I can talk about some LinkedIn ad stuff we're running some LinkedIn ads but you know I want to get the the real deal in you what's up Justin how are you doing I uh, heard you talking trash as if I was. I was trying to join. I was having some some minor issues, but I'm here. All right, Justin. I'm glad that we made this work. Uh, you know, I was I was planning to do just a session on LinkedIn ads because we've been running some LinkedIn ads, and I have a couple things to talk about. But then I thought, wait a second. I know the person who is the, you know, the number one expert on LinkedIn ads. So send you a DM. So yeah, glad you you were able to join. I have a little agenda. We're gonna open it up for Q and A too. So if you guys are watching this and you have questions whether it's on zoom or on linkedin just drop the questions and we'll see if they fit into the conversation we'll just you know i'll, I'll just bring them up during the conversation uh, and then afterwards we're going to open up for q a if you guys have any questions afterwards cool so justin i've been following your content the first thing i want to talk about is so first off i want to skip all the basic stuff i don't want to talk about you know, what is LinkedIn ads, how to create a campaign, what are the different objectives, what's a LinkedIn inside tag. So if you guys are watching this and you've never created a LinkedIn ad or you don't know these things, there's hundreds of tutorials out there. Justin, I think your, your guys' YouTube channel has a bunch of this stuff too. So, uh, you know, we have an hour here, so I don't want to waste it on like the basic stuff that people can find with one Google search. So yeah. I hope that we'll dive into some like nitty gritty stuff right away. And then, <laughs> so if you guys, you know, want to get some basics, you know, I'm going to be recording this. It's going to go live on our YouTube, on our podcast. So once you know the basics, you can come back to this and hopefully learn some more kind of in-depth stuff. Um, cool. So first thing I want to chat with you about is generating inbound meetings from the ads with no leech in form. You got, yeah. you, you've been talking about it. It's how we run the ads. I think it's very counterintuitive to how most you know, B2B marketers or performance marketers think about running ads. The classic thing is you run an ad, you have a CTA in there. That CTA leads people to a demo sign up form, a call, a booking form, or it's just a plain like LinkedIn lead gen form where people enter the information, their email, and then a salesperson reaches out. You guys yeah. have a different approach. So one, talk to me about that approach and two, like why you think that makes sense compared to like the classic approach. Yeah, and I, I think this is a good place to jump in because uh, the you're right the the typical way that most people do this is lead gen form you snag their email you build a an email nurture or you send them over to your sales team and like you know you try to squeeze the conversions out of that um, and I guess my advantage or disadvantage as it were is that I I didn't come from a marketing background I came from a restaurant background I was new to the startup world new to marketing like a freaking baby just, and I still am like, what is this? How does it make sense? Let's start from scratch. And I, I literally do that probably on a quarterly basis. Let's stop. Let's just reset. Let's look at this. Like, Love it. does this make sense today? Do, these are just building blocks, tools that we can use. Like we can rearrange these. So I approached it like that. And I actually, when I started marketing, I learned the basics, like, like everyone does, like, this is how you do it. This is lead gen form. And I tried to build the email nurture and it felt like I was doing like building these actions that didn't quite like, didn't make sense in my mind, how this would result in like, you know, people loving and trusting our, our brand and buying from us. It, it was very transactional. And I guess maybe it works a lot better with e-com, but yeah. for business services, it, it didn't seem to make sense to me. So I went down to kind of, I scrapped it, started from the basics. I took also what was working for me organically at the time, you know, we were getting all of our clients from freelance on Upwork, building a trusted profile there, uh, my organic presence on LinkedIn. And, and so I just picked that apart. You know, what was working about that? Well, I had, I had positioned myself as a visible expert in my space. And I had done that through practical, sharing of knowledge and practical tips that clearly displayed two things, how complicated the subject matter that I'm talking about really is, because I think some people think they want to do it themselves and don't realize how complex it actually is. And then two, that I had a firm grasp of those complexities. And I, you know, if you needed someone, I would be a capable person to handle that for you. Simply doing that organically with LinkedIn, that's how I was driving a lot of business um, inbound. And so, yeah, then I, I got to the point where I said, okay, well, why, why should it be so different for, for paid? Why should what's working yeah. for me on, on LinkedIn organic, not make a good paid strategy? 
but you know, conventional wisdom, like that's crazy talk, but I started to do it. So I started being like, okay, well, I'm not just going to do lead gen form up front. Like all the leads I've done so far for our business, cold lead gen forms, they were utter crap leads. Hardly any of them were worth like putting a human being on to talk to. They weren't shaking, you know, meaning a ton of meaningful conversions out of this email nurture. So I said, I'm just going to stop it. I'm not even going to go for conversions. I'm going to send them to my website. I'm going to let them get a first look at us. And I'm just going to focus on making a good first impression to a good target audience. And yeah. then once I get that visit, I'm going to focus my strategy on retargeting and I'm not just going to do what most people do, which is stay in front of them um, and just like hope it's a timing issue. I'm going to try to move the needle on the biggest thing that is the main objection, which is they don't know me yet. They don't trust me yet. They don't see me as the expert in my space yet. All of my paid strategy is pretty much trying to overcome that. And I, what I found was my organic content that was creating inbound. It was me showing exactly how I do setups, exactly what our current strategy is, yeah. exactly how we help current clients a step by step of the exact strategy and framework we do. And then two things happen. People were like, well, crap, I didn't know you could do that. And this is a lot harder than I thought. And dang, these guys know what they're talking about. Right. And we use that. And uh, yeah, it, it created a, a really nice uh, inbound strategy with paid ads. I think I think it's just common, you, you know, so much of this can be solved with common sense. Like, you know, obviously we're talking here, B2B products or services. So high ACVs, high LTVs. And if you're going to be spending $10,000, $20,000, $50,000, $100,000 on a solution, you're not going to see one ad, click the link, go to the website, book a demo and convert. You know, like anyone who's ever purchased one of these solutions, like knows that, right? There's so much that needs to happen before you're going to go reach out and request a demo, book a sales call. You know, you need to become, well, one, you need to be problem aware, which you might not be. You want to look at competitors. You want to understand, you know, are these people actually experts? Do they understand what they talk about? You know, you want to research them. And so that's why for you guys, I think, and for us too, the main call to action the, that we use for our ads is learn more. Yeah. And then the link that people lead to is our website homepage. Yeah. Right. And because I it's like, think that's, that's what people actually want to do. If you capture them with some ad, it resonates, it makes sense. It speaks to a pain point that they have. It's, it's a great insight that, you know, makes them think, wow, this person really knows what they're talking about. The next step for them is like, let me learn more. And that's yeah. not going to the demo page and requesting a call. It's like browsing through the website and understanding who they are, what they do, what their services are, how their pricing works, et cetera. And it's, it's crazy how that, how controversial that, that one point is like, yeah. we, we send cold traffic to the website. Like you, you, you could just talk about that and you could see people oh just God. like so much push, um, because they either want to, they either want to form capture up front or they want to send them to an isolated landing page. Yeah. That's like a HubSpot glorified form fill. And then my biggest gripe with that is that's their first impression of your brand is this isolated siloed HubSpot landing page that isn't navigatable to your homepage that makes it look like you're some small rinky dink business versus your actual website has like 52 tabs and unlimited resources and all this like stuff. Like, why would you not send them there unless you're embarrassed of your website? Totally. That's usually one of the, the biggest assets you have that you want to show people first. So yeah, totally. it, to me, it doesn't make sense. But yeah, that's me, really controversial. Let me share my, my screen here because I this literally happened yesterday and I think it's a great case study to show here to actually like prove that point because I think people will still not really believe it. This is our ad account for our for our sales project 33. Justin, you probably look at this and you're like, oh my God, this is amateur stuff when you when you see this stuff. But um, you know, if Not I go like at all, if it I takes, go all time, it takes way more skill to finesse uh campaigns with a smaller budget than it does when you're just throwing ungodly amounts of money. So I have I have a lot of respect for small budget marketing campaigns. I got my start with three and five hundred dollar a month budgets. So that's, I, that's how that, I I think I just raised it to six hundred per month. Before that, we were just spending three hundred a month. So you can see right now here we spend two thousand five hundred and sixty euros on our ads, which is whatever three thousand US dollar. Um, we're running currently only cold because we actually don't have a lot of retargeting traffic. Um, and uh, I can show we're running job titles. We have a bunch of our videos in here. You can see like the content that we have in here. You guys can see my screen, right? Just give me a thumbs up if yes. you can see my screen. Yeah. Okay. Spend. You can see here we have one one creative that's just 
do performing really well for us. It literally pulled most of the budget here. You can see that 580 yeah. bucks was spent on this campaign. 450 went only in this ad out of 41 ads. I can, if you guys are interested in me sharing this, this ad, uh, just in the chat, just let me know, put it in the chat and I'll just drop the ad in here. Um, this is performing for us, but as a result, okay. So when people click on that ad, it's a video of me talking about what I would do if I was ahead of marketing. It's a three minute video. This is the call to action, right? Software founder led marketing, which is kind of what we do. And then it's a learn more. And when people press on learn more, it goes to our homepage. Not a demo form, not a fill in your email. It's just literally sends people to our homepage. Now, does this work? And again, I, I didn't have this plan for this session when I scheduled it, but the contract literally came in yesterday. We, one person reached out. I booked a bunch of demos from this. I think we're currently spending like 200 bucks per demo with this. But that's demos. People can be like, whatever. So I have one person reach out with this message inbound on LinkedIn. So this person yeah. sent me inbound this message on LinkedIn. It's an in-mail. So you can, it's, we weren't connected yet. He is a CEO at a software company. Quick chat, interested in your approach, hyphen. So one of your promo vids on my LinkedIn feed, your FLM approach makes a lot of sense. I'm interested in finding out more. Would you have some time today or tomorrow? This... Uh, Contract got signed yesterday. It's a fifty thousand dollar contract, you know. So <laughs> right now, the ROI on our ads yeah, is looking twenty five hundred nice. by fifty thousand. It's like <laughs> what twenty x? <laughs> yeah, twenty x, right? So, and this was ICP, right? This was the founder and CEO of a B two B software company. Fifty people, fifty employees. They have a hybrid PLG SLG motion, high ACVs, perfect customer for us. But what happened was he didn't fill out some legion form. He saw the ad, he clicked the link, he went to our website. And then once he was kind of convinced that this is interesting, he went back to LinkedIn and sent me a direct message to yeah. book a call, right? And this is this kind of, and what's even more interesting, what you can, what you can see in the message is, and, and that's why they closed after two calls. Like think about that, a $50,000 contract, cold, closed after two calls, he, where do I have the message? He says, your FLM approach makes a lot of sense. The ad never yeah. talked about FLM. The only way how we found out about FLM is he went to our website, read through it, and then used our abbreviation, right? So this is an example of kind of <laughs> how this stuff can work. I was going to um, say, you already got acronyms over here. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> trying to do, like, it's literally, this is the only place where it's on our website. Like in this little yeah. box on our homepage, right? With all this text. So we know that this guy read our homepage yeah. and it resonated. And that's why he reached out, right? I wanted to share this because it's it's one example of, of how this can work. All right, Justin. Um, the CTRs on there were really good as well. 2% on cold ads that on vi cold video ads, that's actually really impressive. It's really good stats. And um, the other thing I think that really shows is the humanization of the of the brand as well. And and probably to your point, founder-led marketing, what that did, because he didn't come inbound through the website. You humanized your brand so much that he personally reached out to you on LinkedIn, like feeling that he had some kind of connection to you after right. seeing like paid ads and then looking, you know, at the website and probably checked out your personal profile as well. Yeah. That's kind of cool. All right, I, I put the link to the ad in the in the Zoom chat. So yeah, Soraya and Sorab, you guys were asking for it. So you guys can can look at that. All right. Um also FYI, yeah. I heard that uh -huh. LinkedIn uh is rolling out video, um, supporting video now for influencer ads or the thought oh, leader ads. I was waiting for that. Supposedly it's supposedly it's it was supposed to roll out today. That's what okay. so we I'm going to create a reminder right now to set up these ads today. We had we had the great pleasure of actually hiring a LinkedIn technical support uh, rep as one of our account managers. So now she is flooding us with useful information and uh, has us tapped into insights that I never had before. Oh, that's amazing. That's amazing. All right. Um, cold campaigns, retargeting campaigns. You know, if we, if we think about that very broadly, maybe you actually think there should be more. I saw some kind of awareness consideration and then conversion, how people structure these. I think about them as cold and retargeting. Talk me through cold campaign. Let's start with the cold campaign. What, so, yeah. What objectives, uh, what audience sizes am, am I looking for? There we go. Yeah. 
we were going to break this out at some point usually. Um, so yeah, to me, and, and this is going to be, there's two different conversations. So actually most of the people that we work with are SMBs. They're small to medium sized companies. We work with a lot of 50 to 200 company size, a lot of 11 to 50. And then now we are stretching more into like enterprise and we have a lot more clients that are doing ABM motion, but this framework right here, I, I do need to disclaim it. It's not the perfect framework for an ABM approach, or if it was, you wouldn't, you wouldn't have a robust retargeting audience to build something out. You would build more of this out just in the cold layer. Um, but if you have a decent total addressable market, um, and a good group to target on LinkedIn, then a framework like this would really help. And, and the difference that I, so the way I structure uh, mine is my cold ads are usually actually pretty boring. My initial cold ads are usually more straightforward. I want it to be a good, like first touch. If they've never heard of us before, they never interacted with our brand and they see an ad or a video for the first time. I think in my mind, it should clearly tell them who, who we are, what we do, who we serve, like something promotional would be really nice. Other things that work really well is really hammering on the main pain points that you solve that usually drive people to you. If you can hit on that pain point in a good ad or video that gets them curious about the solution, they'll, they'll dig in and, and see if you might be able to help. Or if you talk about, you know, the results. Um, so those three pillars are, are usually where I try to focus. Um, obviously depending on a brand and what, what's working for them or assets they have, that could be completely different. But to me, I like it to be more almost promotional, straightforward. This is who we are. This is what we do. Those clicks, those views actually mean something instead of, I wouldn't do like top of funnel checklists, um, basic advice, like how to get started kind of advice. I would, I would, yeah, do more promotional straightforward. And then what I'm doing, oh, and ahead. is this yeah, brand awareness? Yeah, it would be brand awareness objective or website clicks. I still use a lot. Um, and I wouldn't use a conversion objective until you actually have a, a, right. a decent amount of conversions in your account. But yeah, awareness or uh, website. Why not engagement? Click. Because you just want to get cheap CPMs. Um, my actually, my team is a little split on on different approaches for these campaigns. Um, engagement and awareness um, can 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 work. Um, because all of the ones that I just showed you ours are engagement, and maybe yeah. I'm fucking up there. No, and your. I think the engagement that you're getting, like the one thing that I saw on your ad that contributes to those results is that you get social engagement. Like, so yeah, I it think has like 120 you, likes and a bunch of yeah. shit. Yeah. And I guarantee you, like you look at the stats, the CTR, this, the CPC now at a hundred likes or whatever versus whatever, like it's building momentum. So I don't, I think the problem is most people don't have engageable content that they can run as ads. Like a lot of companies We're gonna don't get have to that. Engaging yep. videos. So for you, I do think that makes perfect sense. For most okay. people, I don't think they have the right. It's also like, why doesn't why don't I put video in my funnel? I love video and they people should use video. If you have it, it is a great layer to use. But reality is most people don't have amazing video assets they can deploy. So I created this framework more for like the average everybody. But wouldn't um, engagement those. then just expose that? I mean, if if you don't have engaging content running brand awareness to just show it to a lot of people, it's not going to make it suddenly engaging. You know what I mean? Like, yeah. Then but, if you run engagement, you would at least see, holy shit, that no one's engaging with this. We need to fix something. So we've run website visit um, and brand awareness pretty effectively in the cold layer. And I guess one of the thoughts to do is so for engagement, it's technically the platform is going to try to optimize for the action. So if the desired action is engagement, it would it would show those ads. Well, I right. guess, I mean, you have the, the target ICP, but it's going to prioritize people that are more likely to engage. Right. Whereas website clicks are more, act are more likely to be people that are maybe like actually more in market, like more consideration. So there, there might be a trade-off there and there's not enough like, you know, cold, cold hard facts for me to say that yeah. the website clicks is prioritizing higher intent like prospects. But there's some subtle like underneath logic that in my mind that tells me that. Right. Um, but that might be getting a little too much in the weeds uh, for for some of this. So okay. I, so I think, cold, you uh, you suggest brand awareness, just kind of main pain point you solve, service you offer, results of working with you, and you say yeah. single image ads just because they're like easy to create and spin yeah. up for companies, or is there any other? 
if you have video, I would recommend video for cold because you can retarget by video percent. Then it's not if they engaged, yes or no. It's not just binary. It's how engaged were they? And then can I pull, do I want to pull the 25% or more views, 50%, 75%, 97% or more views. So you can gauge how engaged they were and you could have like different tracks if you wanted. So I do think video works really well. And I will say, I do think influencer ads or the thought leader ads, that ad type would be a great first touch um, because I think part of it is even people who are interested in the product or service, knowing that it's an ad are less likely to engage. Right. If it's if it's something subject matter expertise or something interesting on the subject and they didn't realize it was an ad, they might engage with it a lot more willingly. And then you can still retarget them um, and pull them into retargeting. But then uh, the whole idea for me around LinkedIn, everyone loves the targeting and they think like it's an amazing source for like cold targeted traffic, which it is, but that's the most expensive aspect of LinkedIn. The best part of LinkedIn ads to me in any mature marketing ecosystem is that LinkedIn ads to my knowledge is the only platform that can pick up on all of your website traffic, clean it, qualify it, and just retarget mm -hmm. the qualified prospects. Mm -hmm. And that's really important because when you think of marketing, not in a silo, you take, you take the biggest flaws with SEO, Facebook, cold, Google, uh, Google ads, the biggest thing, challenge they face is that it's uh, uh, unfocused traffic. There's no way to qualify it like a ton before, or after the click. And if you do amazing SEO work, you're flooded with great top of funnel traffic. You just don't know the quality of that. So then you're hesitant to retarget all of your website visitors because right. it's a hodgepodge. So these, these companies start siloing the retargeting. They only want to retarget what they specifically sent from LinkedIn because it's the only traffic they trust. But what they don't realize is you can actually use all Filter. of those same filters yeah. and, and layer on and clean and qualify all of your website traffic. So your Google, SEO, Facebook, you can say all my website visitors from the last 90 days, but they have to be director level and above seniority from these right. five industries I serve, these companies with budget in these countries that I'm willing, like I'm comfortable working with. I just want to retarget these. And that's why I build a bigger framework out for LinkedIn retargeting, because this is the, the main space that I know I can saturate and dominate a quality prospect pool. And then my goal is just like I do on LinkedIn organic is for this pool, for them to, for me to position myself and our company as the experts in our space. And for this pool, if they need a LinkedIn ads agency, they know who to go to because we have dominated their feed effectively. And so my, so is my that the standard is, thing? I know we're, we're jumping ahead here, but so is yeah. that your standard when you retarget and you retarget website traffic, you always add the job title, uh, filter in there. And initially, title? initially I would start broad. So initially your goal is just to get into retargeting. So I might take 25% video views, 180 day company visits, yeah. uh, you know, as broad as I can to get into retargeting. And then the biggest thing after you get into retargeting is the level of frequency, the level of saturation. Uh, so, so ideally in my mind, like a good, a good in feed retargeting campaign should have like a 90 day frequency of about 15 to 20. So a good 90 campaign, day campaign, campaign level campaign, uh -huh. they should see about 15 to 20 ads from that campaign over 90 days. So I shoot for that. I, I look at it on a weekly, monthly basis. I monitor it because that number changes. It's relative to the audience size. So it, as the audience grows, the only two levers you have to control that frequency is either increasing budget if you need to increase the frequency or decreasing the audience size. So right. first you just get into retargeting and then to control frequency, once the audience size starts getting kind of bigger and the frequency starts diminishing, you chop that down with filters. So first I add seniority level and see where that takes me. Usually that'll chop it down in half and I'm fine right. for a couple of weeks or a month or whatever. Then I add in maybe... Um, company sizes. And I would go broader than like my perfect ICP. I would allow like, you know, decent people in my target addressable market. Like don't, maybe I wouldn't waste the precious cold dollars targeting people in the, I don't know, 10 to or whatever range, but I I don't mind retargeting them if they found right. me somehow. Right, right, right. Um, and then, yeah, so you slowly stack those filters on, but the idea is you do it in a way that's strategically condensing the audience size so that you keep your saturation and frequency uh, at the desired level. So when you say 90 and campaign level frequency is 15, that means like on average, they see one of your ads every six days. Yeah, from like that campaign. But as you'll see in like my framework, I have like multiple campaigns. So their, their overall saturation might be, you know, higher than that. But my 
the the big thing is almost every company has like a main 90 day retargeting campaign. And then they usually will have like other sub stacks and, and different types. But if you can control the saturation of your main, like 90 day, uh, retargeting campaign, that's like doing most heavy lifting, that's where you're going to control like most of the results. And then, yeah, I try to swarm them with different ad types, um, text ads, spotlight ads. This one's kind of two dimensional. Like this only has like one really solid in feed other than a lead gen. But on mine, I have single image. I have video. I also, um, I also layer in, I'll, I'll just explain this really briefly. Cool. So if, if they, if they interact with website, company page, cold ads, they get queued into the 90 day retargeting. If they make it through 90 days without interacting with any ads, I have all of the in-feed expensive ads drop off and I just let the spotlight text and follower ads persist for another three months. So it's not a separate like 90 to 180 day. These three campaigns exist in the 90 day. Uh, they continue on after 90 days, but everything else drops off. So I just stay in front of them and lightly nurture. We keep their logo on their screen. We give them an opportunity to click back whenever they want, but it's really pennies on the dollar. But if they do interact with any of the ads in our 90 day retargeting layer, uh, we segment that group out into a 30 day, really strong CTA. That's where I would push them with the strongest call to action you have, send them straight to the calendar link or lead gen and send that to your sales team. Uh, this it engages be... anything like one action. If they click the link yeah. once, if they got it. Yeah. And the way I have our setup is it's if they, if they watch any of the videos in my retargeting, uh, layer, if they click any of the ads in my what retargeting percentage layer for video, um, view? Oh, for video, uh, I think it has to be 75%, um, mm -hmm. for mine. And then I also, the UTMs that we set up for like other platforms that send retargeting traffic back to our website, they all have, you know, retargeting in the UTM. So I set up an audience in LinkedIn uh, to collect anyone who visits my page, a page on our website that contains retargeting in the, in the URL. Um, and I have that audience as well. So I, I should be picking up some retargeting traffic from like my other channels as well that gets funneled into uh, this as well. Interesting. Have you, uh, guys, we're jumping around a little bit. As I said, I want to get in the weeds. If you guys have any questions at any point, just drop them in the chat if anything doesn't make sense or you have follow-up questions. Do you have any data on image versus carousel versus video ad on the same topic? Yeah, by just by ad format, carousel is probably going to get... a uh, Single image ad has the highest uh, CTR usually and the lowest cost per click. Video usually has a higher cost per click, a lower CTR. And carousel ads are are some of the like harder ones, I think they have some of the highest cost per click and the, the lowest CTRs, but they're trade-offs. So obviously if someone will watch 97% of the video, like, uh, so, you know, it's a much, and then they click that's 10 times like more intent and a stronger, like a warmer prospect than someone who saw a single image and clicked and then bounced off the website really fast. So, you know, you do have to weigh that they're, they're not. Yeah. Let's spend some time on this because I think let's talk about Campaign level optimization and then pipeline level optimization. Campaign level optimization basically means you just look at your LinkedIn ad um, manager and you see, okay, we get this many cost per click, CTR, blah, blah, blah. And then pipeline, you know, you actually see how are these deals progressing into book demo, into stage one, stage two, close one, et cetera. So with what you just said, if, if if a campaign manager would just look at my image ad versus my video ad, and they would see all of our image ads get lower cost per clicks and higher CTRs, like why would I run any video ads, right? But obviously yeah. that's short-sighted. So we do need to like apply some common sense here of like, yeah, the reason why they're probably have lower CTRs and high, uh, higher CTRs and lower cost per clicks is because they're easier to engage with right? They're just yeah. an image. If something you click on it, a video like is a little bit of a commitment. If it's a two minute video, you need to actually spend two minutes to watch that video. But if you have someone who did spend that two minutes, the quality of that lead or prospect or demo is higher than someone who came from just clicking on an image. Yeah. So how do you and balance this... that though? Like, how do you, like, are you guys in, in your customer CRM? Are you waiting for them to communicate back? Like, Hey, people tell us we came from that. So it's this, there is an issue that we run into a lot and, and this is part of the lead gen versus demand gen kind yeah. of whole discussion because it's, it's some of these like set KPIs 
that are so situational that it's it's not helpful to have some of these universal like cost to me cost per click needs so much context ctr needs so yeah. much context for me to know if that's good or bad like because like people judge these different things for example you if you run a text ad in retargeting layer ctr is going to be terrible like 0.1 0.0 whatever but you you look at it from and and so if you're just looking at that then you'll say man these are terrible we should shut them off and they're not getting any clicks i look at it i see that it shows 30,000 impressions to warm prospects hasn't hasn't got or got one click and so yeah it showed expensive but i got a crap ton of free advertising like if there was a billboard and they let you put your company logo and tagline up there for free and you only paid if someone called this really special support line like, and no one ever called it, like, wouldn't you think that's a, a freaking good deal? Like you're getting oh free God. advertising. Like I would pray that they don't call me, but people are so short-sighted. They're like, yeah, but the CPC is bad. I'm like, I don't give a crap. Like we'll look <laughs> at the bigger picture. So I it's think stuff like that. I, 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 I want to talk about, about this. Yeah, yeah. Go ahead. <laughs> because it's like did. people, people are like, okay, people don't understand on LinkedIn ads. You can target specifically by industry, by job title, by seniority level. Like you can get very narrow on your exact ICPs. Like I can say, I want to show our ads to only founders and co-founders of software development companies in the US who have between 11 and 50 employees yeah. and who have a growth of at least 20% year over year. Like that's insane. And then I know if I get a click, if I get an impression, if I get some reach, they're from these exact people who we sell to, right? And yeah. so then people are like, well, but you know, what's the CPM? Well, how much can I pay? It's like, if someone told you, you can build a billboard on the right of the, on the side of the road and you can yeah. put whatever message you want to put on it text video you can put an image there and i'm going to guarantee you that every day a thousand people of your exact perfect buying persona are going to drive by that road sign how much money are you willing to spend on that most people would say holy shit that's crazy mm -hmm. that's linkedin ads right now yeah but they'll say, oh, what's the CPC on that? It doesn't, <laughs> yeah, it doesn't look that good. So, uh, so I take that. And um, because, yeah, one of the other things is, you know, it, it is so dangerous to have your heart set on a metric for a certain channel like CPL. Um, CPL is really dangerous to chase because, I mean, logically, if you see this through, like it makes perfect sense. Like if my goal as a marketer or, you know, good as I am, if my goal is to get you, if you tell me my job is to get you as many leads as possible for the least amount of money, there's only one logical conclusion that happens uh, inevitably. I will find the lowest quality and lowest priced leads. Like, yeah. and, and that's what these ad platforms do. That's their yeah. job. That's what you told them was important. And yeah. their job is to get as many of those at the cheapest price. There's only one logical way to do it, to, to find the lowest common denominator. So yes, you can set your parameters, but then from the parameters you set, it will find, but usually like, yeah, they're going broad and then getting those. Uh, but to your point about the video, like, so yeah, there, there's things, there's tangibles and there's intangibles. Like logically, if you step back and you say, yeah, a click after watching two minutes of this video is not the same as a click after seeing uh, a half second of this, whatever. So I put weight. I do go that extra mile and I try to get channel attribution for as much as I can. So I actually can see that there's correlation down the pipeline. Like I can see booked calls and we actually can see purchases um, in our channel. So I actually can see that these videos are producing more meaningful pipeline versus the single image. Um, actually our single image ad really kills it. Our, our main campaign, um, I, I really do. I have video campaigns, but I also have a, a solid single image campaign um, that's been running forever. I, it, it's really powerful, I think, because all the social proof it's accumulated because yeah. Yeah. it's like my greatest hits. But um, that one does really good for us. Let's talk about attribution then. Um, so there's a LinkedIn insight tag, which people should obviously install. Um, and uh, we actually have it installed. It doesn't work for us. Like if you go to our LinkedIn campaign that I just showed you, I think the mm -hmm. LinkedIn insight tag like collected like two demos, two demo conversions. But I know that there's way more because I have the sales calls and I talk to people and I ask them, how did you find us? And they're like, oh, I saw this video where you talked about what you would do as a head of marketing in my LinkedIn feed. And, you know, that's how I found out. So what's the flaw there? How do you guys approach attribution self-reported attribution is obviously thing talk to me how what's yeah. your framework 
So I got my inspiration early on from e-com and, you know, you wouldn't, you wouldn't dare like launch an e-com campaign without being able to track like the end goal, you know, like a purchase and they take it to an extra extent. They're passing through stuff like dynamic stuff to the UTM. They know the exact purchase. Right. Uh, then they track those people like recurring purchase. Like, so in, in that sense, B2B where 90% of B2B companies can't actually track even booked meetings um, in their, in their channel, let alone like, uh, you know, God forbid they could actually track like a paying client in the individual channels, they would blow a gasket. So it's a different mindset, but what I do in the channels is, um, I first, you have to set up your website usually in, in order to have these checkpoints, any tr trackable action or any action you want to track in my mind should have a URL checkpoint they hit. So if, you know, pricing and contact should probably be on separate pages. So you can segment those out as intent views. Um, if they actually submit a form on your website, they should get pushed to a thank you page. Yep. If they book a call through Calendly or HubSpot, it should push them to a booked call confirmed page back on your website that you can track. And in a perfect world, either from the purchase page or as part of the onboarding, they should get pushed to like a welcome or thank you purchase page on your website that lets you track that as a goal point as well. Then in all your channels, LinkedIn included, yeah, you should be able to set up rules that the catch is I, for meaningful conversions, I would set up their LinkedIn has only two little attribution things. You can set up last touch each campaign or last touch last campaign. Yeah. Uh, do, do you know what yours is set up for? Uh, last campaign. Otherwise it shows okay. up multiple times, right? Exactly. Okay, good. So I think that might be why it's not um, properly showing attribution fully for you. What I would do for- if My theory is that the page loads too, too slowly. We have a Wix web website. It loads super slowly. So when people book a calendar, it redirects to the thank you page. But I mm. think by the time that they book the calendar, they just click out and it just doesn't load the thank you page fast enough for the inside tag to actually track it. it. Could. Because we get some data, like I've tested it, it works. Yeah. So I would say, I would test this. So what I do for meaningful conversion, so let's talk about that. Cause I think this is a big point that, okay. I mean, it's, it's a little thing, but it, it has big implications. So last touch, last campaign versus last touch each campaign. Um, and the, the, the two, the difference is if, if they, if they interact or are shown ads from four different campaigns and then they convert last touch, each campaign would Guys, give, each give of those campaigns right in the credit. chat. If it would be helpful for me to share my screen while we talk through this. Oh, I could probably do that. You or you can, you can share your screen. I think that would be good. Look at all those ad accounts. <laughs> <Don't>. <laughs> Look at all those ad accounts. Um, testing, 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 test. I think you guys like testing. I do a lot of like <laughs> how-tos and demos and I don't clean this up. So in conversion, in conversion tracking, and you can see some of mine are dormant, but we have um, call booking. Uh, I, we don't have any form fills on our website. It's just call booking or purchase and we can track those. Uh, so when you're setting up a new conversion, this is what I'm talking about here. Last touch each or last touch last. So it last touch each, if they interact with or see four campaigns and then they convert last touch, each would give each of those campaigns credit. Um, it's good and it's bad. The bad, which is why, uh, Finn opted not to do it is that your campaign will report four conversions. You only had one booked meeting. So you can see why that's bad. The the good thing about each though is it does show the journey. Like, wouldn't it wouldn't it be good to know right. that they interacted with these three ads before converting? Because otherwise, when you're optimizing, you're going to be tempted to be like, oh, all the conversions are coming from here. You don't realize you have these campaigns that are assisting. This one build trust. This one showed like a key interview that uh, moved the needle. This one showed like a testimonial that whatever. And then this one had a call to action that you know, push them into action. And if you kill these three, this one's going to dry up. It's the same thing when people look at, oh, all my, all my conversions are coming from retargeting. I guess we, and nothing's coming from the cold campaign. I should just turn that off mm -hmm. while you're killing the fuel that's funneling all those conversions into retargeting. So last touch, last campaign would say only this one gets the conversion. So good because it's one-to-one -one ratio, bad because you can't see the journey. My solution, do both, both. and give them separate oh. values. Last touch, last campaign, give it a higher value. Like my call bookings, like 150. Last touch each campaign, um, give it a lesser value, like $10. So you know it was part of the journey. You're not tempted to kill it. Um, and I'll, I'll show you how this plays out in the campaign. So in the campaign, you can click breakdown and you can look at the breakdown of conversions. So if you look at ours, you'll see it. We have we have all of these eaches that are touching. We have confirmed purchase each. We have, these are the last, these are the booked call last. And you can see it down to like the, oh, these are my text ads. And I get a lot of stuff uh, denied. Uh, so this is, let's see. 
because you say yeah, LinkedIn sure. in it. Yeah, I and uh, I had to get them denied a, a lot. Uh, let's see. So, oh, this one just launched. So yeah, you can see it down to the campaign level, but this is how the the breakdown would show, and you can see like this. This gives me like amazing detail um, of what's working, what's not, and what you know right. what I should could turn off and what I shouldn't turn off. Uh, so this is this is uh, what I would recommend for like conversion tracking um, for people. And then you can see it down to the creative. And some of them, yeah, will only pick up eaches, but they seem like an important part of the journey. And then some seem really good at like pushing them over the edge, uh, which is really nice. So how do you decide what to turn off? You know, the campaign that, that I just showed you that we're running, it has 41 creatives in it, which is basically yeah. our 41 best performing videos of all time. Yeah. Like 90% or 80% of that budget is being pulled by that one video. Yeah. You know, it's should strong. I turn off all the other ones? I'm like, LinkedIn is already allocating my budget to the best performer. As long as yeah. the um, the frequency is in a range that's okay with me, I'm just not going to turn off on any of the other ads. Like, so how what do you, I, what, what do you base the decision on to like stop, turn off an ad? So I would do a couple of things. So your ad is in the cold layer. So I would be curious what the frequency is um, because if you targeted really uh, tightly, and it's a small tight group, which it might be, your frequency might be high enough that you might actually benefit from not letting it lead with performance. You might actually benefit from- uh, Should we do a live teardown? That do you think that would yours? add value? You, we can. You, you just literally shit on my ad account. I did not. You got. You already have like a 20X ROI. So if it's, <laughs> that's one if convert. It's, if it's flawed, then you're doing all right. Um. All right, so- what do you want me to show you? Okay. Three campaigns so, here. Um, the what time frame is this? Okay, this is all time. Go to the last uh, thirty days. Okay, the thirty days, and th that's your main one. The yeah, the cold. Okay, okay. Scroll over to the okay. Um, actually, no. Go to delivery. Oh, you have a custom one. I want to see frequency. Um. Okay. Average frequency 1.78. So this is 30 day frequency. Yeah. So it, multiply that by three to get the 90 day possible frequency. What? 1.5. So it's, uh, let's see what the actual 90 days is. 2.0, but has it been running for 90 days? Yes. I think this one. Yeah. That one has -ish. actually no, no, so no. This is a like good point. 60 days, 60 days. This, this is a really good point that most people don't understand. So frequency is very relative to the time frame you are specifically looking at and the amount of data that's in there. So your 90 day frequency number here is not accurate because you don't have 90 yeah. days worth of right. data. Right, right, so right. the 30 day frequency is probably more accurate. And then if right. you multiply that times three, you might have a better view. It might be 4.5. That's your 90 day frequency. Right. And in my world, if frequency, if 90 day frequency is above three, I kind of go more into like retargeting mode. It's more about mm. like, instead of just showing, if my frequency is less than three and 90 days on a cold campaign, lead with performance and just hammer them with your top ad. Like, I think that's a good strategy. So that's what you're currently doing. And it's working. Your top ad is is performing. I mean, let's see something. what's the frequency on that one ad is. Must be quite high. It, they can only be shown that one unique creative, I think every 48 hours. So yeah, it still might be decent. 1.6, 1. 1. that's 30. But everything else is like one or like barely. So they might see one of those other ads. Um, so yeah, they're, they're mostly seeing that one. So the benefit would be, you know, instead of showing, I did, probably what's happening right now is these people are seeing, they're seeing the same ad a couple of times um, a month. And maybe maybe that's good, maybe it's not. Um, and they're seeing if they're in, in their, queue for 90 days, they're seeing the same ad probably five times over 90 days. Now, mm. would they, would it be better to show them five different ads over 90 right, days? Probably if you, if you know for sure. Certain time. ones, case studies. Yeah. yeah. So usually what I do is I, I, for, for a cold campaign, I look at what my three or four month kind of frequency is. And I boil down to the top creatives in that group. Um, so yeah, you said you have how many, uh, ads in here? 41. Yeah, so uh, most of the other ones getting shown are probably like, like not. It's and it's it's probably deterring. Like, I mean, because of how dominating that one ad is, I don't know. Maybe that would maybe that might be a decent strategy. Maybe it's 
outperforming the other ones by such a landslide, but the, the higher frequency does make me like tend to make me want to say, Hey, we should distribute this, yeah. but even distribution across 40, you might actually be shooting yourself in the foot because now you're not showing your hero ad near right. enough. We want to get other stuff. But I, can, I mean, I can still add a retargeting on top that if yeah. they watch this video, which now a bunch of people watch, I make sure that they watch our case studies, yeah. which I want to make sure that they watch. I want to make sure that they watch certain like core concepts around why our solution works or makes sense in the first place. So that's a really good thought. You could, and I've done this, you could have your cold campaign be super simple. This one hero ad is the entry point. And mm. then you, and then you pull those who viewed it and you simply duplicate this campaign and you flip it into retargeting. They viewed this one. Now you show them the other four All the other ones. Ever, over uh, the next 90 days, but you make that do, your, your entry um, point. That's their first impression of you, which is a good one, apparently. And then you just show these ones in retargeting versus trying to get them all to compete uh, with that hero ad in cold. Or you separate that hero ad out, give it its own budget, and then you run these ones rotating evenly to actually mm -hmm. give them a fair shot to compete. And then you yeah. see if there's a couple of, uh, you know, if there's another winner that can emerge from there. Interesting. Um, let's quick job title versus job um, uh, type. Oh. That's maybe we can look at your, uh, yeah. Targeting too. Cause there is, there is one that I heard you mention that I might take off. I have, I have my, views. I think I took the 20 plus growth out. If that's what you, <laughs> you mean. know, I was talking about. <laughs> <laughs> so right now it's Europe and a for us job titles, co-founder revenue officer, VP marketing, uh, basically have another thought. the market and then Europe. For, yeah, go ahead. Europe. And what was the other target? North America Europe, Europe and, and North America. So. And what's your total daily budget? 10 per day minimum. Okay. So I can almost guarantee that the entire budget is spent. In, I, I wonder if they, we can see a map. Um, probably Europe would take all the budget before bidding ever opens up in America every single day. So there's, there's oh. a chance running a, a low uh, a low daily budget to multiple time zones that it never makes it to the later time zone. Um, we ran do this. We do that, edit more chart. Doesn't it show yeah. that here? Uh, demographics. Show maybe demographics and country uh, or location. Country. No, county. Well, country slash region. Oh. Mexico, Ukraine, Poland, Serbia, Portugal, Spain, Romania, Croatia, France, Bulgaria, Italy, Czech, US is here. Okay. So two point. Yeah, only 2.3. That's, yeah, that's bad. I need to, I need to. Yeah. So pull out most US. Us usually the priority, because they're like, Usually people are saying, okay, US is my priority, but I also serve over here. And then what happens is like it just UK shows the or the Europe islands. takes all of the budget before bidding opens in the United oh. States. So if you wanted to, so one of the one of the things that I've learned to kind of manipulate or or get where I'm going is that splitting stuff out in campaigns is the best way to control budget. So if I have two time zones, if I have like if I wanted to control spending on that hero ad, if I have whatever segments, segment it out to its own to its own campaign so you can control. So at Got least it. yeah, that way you can say and then if you um if you're on our ad scheduling tool, I don't know if I I'll give, uh, I can throw you a free seat if you're not on there. Oh, I'll take it. But I would, I would schedule it because then you can get around the minimums like, and for like your budget, like, yeah, $10 a day might get spent before five in the morning. Like ideally you'd like to set right. a time and say, let's start the bidding at 5am and go like, you know, at least not be bidding in the middle of the night or before, like right. have the whole budget gone by four in the morning. And then, yeah, before uh, my other markets even wake up right. and then you could, you could have your Europe and your United States one, you could have $10 a day in both of them, but you could like alternate totally. them running oh, every brilliant. other day. So you could run twice as many ads with the same $10 a day budget and just rotate them in with a little ad scheduling. Uh, let me ask this question that Andy put in here. In the cult layer, do you target leads or accounts, i.e. better to show ads to all levels of a company or pinpoint specific job titles we're interested in? Uh, it depends on how big the like the audience is. So it goes both ways. If if you do have a key list, because you know a lot of people really, you know, ABM is still a hot topic. A lot of people have their account list and they want to target. If you have those account lists, I would definitely say expand beyond the decision makers. I would do seniority and job function instead of job titles, and I I would expand out. Also, if you have a very small like total addressable market, like say you're trying to target prospects, but the list is still just small. I would expand to other people in that organization that are in the room. My my whole thought process of theory is if I get someone excited about my solution in the company and someone else in that room has heard of us before when they, you know, start bringing that up, like 
that yeah. can move the needle really fast. So, uh, but if it, if the audience is way too big, then right. yeah, maybe specific job titles, or if, you know, if you have 130 K prospect list with job titles, then yeah, I wouldn't expand it uh, a ton beyond that. Right. I, I think it's that point plus, you know, understanding your buying journey. So if you, for us, you know, the, the person signing off on it is either the founder or the head of marketing or whoever yeah. or head of marketing, CRO, VP marketing. But how it might happen is that a marketing manager or someone on their team, social media specialist, like follows me on LinkedIn, sees our yeah. stuff and then goes to their head of marketing and say, hey, like, is this something that might be interesting for us? Right. So like you, you don't want to just, you, you want to target the influencer too, not just the budget holder. Agreed. I would say this though, marketing specifically, um, li- title is a free form field on LinkedIn and there is right. no more creative <laughs> group than marketers. Oh so you might God. be trying to target the VP of marketing, but you, you, there might be titles like the magician of leads and the Houdini of demand <laughs> gen and, you know, so marketing might be one of those areas where you you could also consider like maybe expanding in that department because yeah they get really creative with job titles in that industry and and there's a couple other industries where because of that because because title is a free form field it might consider like leaving a little more leeway marketing's yeah. funny and you did that <laughs> answer your question any follow up um Oops. let me go to Break my chair all right, let's talk about creatives because I think, you know, we talked about campaigns, cold retargeting, LinkedIn inside tag, you know, objectives, audience, blah, 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 blah. But I don't know how you see it, but I think the biggest bottleneck is, I mean, the, I think that one, the biggest bottleneck is just product market fit. Like, do you actually sell something that people want, right? If you don't have that, like no amount of ads or optimizing or yeah. funnel hacking or whatever is going to help you. And then yeah. once you have a product or service that people actually want, then it's like the creative, right? So how do you think about that? Like just general thoughts first, and then we can like dive into specifics. My my general thought might be actually a little controversial. I know like uh, in LinkedIn and in like, it is more of a creator economy. So I feel like having this uh, opinion might be a little controversial on that, but I think most people screw up their marketing. Like it, it's not a, if this, then that, like design and creative is extremely important, but nine times out of 10, it's like, it's because the setup, the structure, the technical side of the setup, so much of the budget is getting wasted and the most beautiful right. assets in the world cannot fix that. And conversely, like the most technical, beautiful setup in the world will not do anything if you don't have product market fit or if the creative is terrible or if you have no idea what the pain points of your client are. So it, it, they're very equally important. And and the the content, the quality of the content, the level of, in, in, of engagement the content has, the extraction of subject matter expertise, um, that has, I would say the, the substance, maybe the messaging and the meat, um, is way more important than the imagery, yeah. uh, because yeah, the fanciest imagery in the world, if it's fluffy things that like the, the marketing first month marketing intern could have put together, it's not going to move the needle on anything substantial, but conversely a well thought out, like amazing practical tip that speaks to like your technical, um, uh, knowledge, but has a stick figure image that could actually do something like that could move the needle. Um, but it would do better with, you know, an actual video or, or better imagery, of course. Right. Yeah. I mean, when I say, when I say creative, I, I don't mean, you know, the logo and the colors and the design, I mean the messaging. Right. And I yeah. think the way that I think about it, I, I, I learned this term from, from Philip, the founder of Comex message market fit, which is product market fit. We all know it's like, you have a product that people actually want. The next step after that is message market fit is figuring out what, what messages are actually resonating with your buyers that make them be interested, curious, want to buy your thing, right? And I think, yeah. you know, what pain points are you solving? What challenges in their day-to-day business are you addressing? You know, what metrics are you driving that they actually care about? And so, you know, there's two ways to get there. One is to just have a deep, deep, deep customer understanding through talking with them, interviewing them, asking them. There's frameworks like the jobs to be done interview to figure out why people go shopping for your solution rather than why they buy your solution, right? You want to hear 
from your customers why they decided to go look for your solution, why they decided to go, like buy it from you, why, you know, what pain point it solves for them. Like you need to have this tight and you need to have it in the words that your customers are actually using. So the best thing there is just recorded sales calls, right? Like, and then just copy paste whatever they told you. Um, or if you don't have that, maybe you don't have a lot of customers yet. Maybe you're, I don't know, you don't want to interview them or ask them questions or take your time, which is a bad you know, thing. The next one is just to iterate and experiment with a lot of things, right? To throw things against the wall and see what sticks basically. And you know, the head of what I would do as a head of marketing video for our ad, that's one of them. Like I, I created this video for my organic LinkedIn. It did yeah. well there. Like it got like 93 likes organically, which for me was a really well-performing post, like did way better than most of my average posts. So that's why I added it to the campaign. Now, did I know that it will go off that well? No, but you know, it's, yeah. I didn't know upfront that this is the message that my buyers are interested in, but I tested it put it out into the market, posted it organically, saw the feedback that it got a lot of engagement from the right people. And so then I amplified that in the campaign. So, you know, like you need to figure out like what pain points you're solving, how your customers think about your solution. Um, do you guys use a framework for that? Like when you work with a customer, do you send them a questionnaire? Do you, I don't know, interview their customers? What, what how, how can people reach these insights? Yeah, I, I agree. The messaging is is really important um, and one of the most important things. And uh, the way the way that we would approach it is, yeah, we do inter we do talk to our our clients and we try to extract as much you know as this information and push them on it. The so we're not jumping and talking to their uh, their actual clients. Ideally, they would be you know doing that, surfacing their own insights. But we push them for yeah those main pain points that you're solving, the main results, the main reason people come to you, how they talk about it. Um, internally, we use a mixture. We're we're talking to clients. I'm talking to the sales team. They're passing back information. We're also getting our own research from our other marketing channels, how people are searching for LinkedIn ads. What are the most asked questions? What are the topics they're most interested in? What are the reasons that they're you know searching for that they end up actually purchasing. So those pain points that actually lead to the biggest action, you can find those in some of your other marketing channels. Um, because you know people are searching for you or finding you in, in Google and SEO in different ways, but there's certain pain points or certain results or certain case studies that they gravitate towards that seem to push more action than others. So finding those, surfacing those, talking to the prospects or talking to the clients. Um, and we do test a lot of stuff as well. And, and we discover new things. I test it organically. Um, I like to use text ads and spotlight ads um, and follower ads to test little messaging. Mm -hmm. And then when I find stuff that works, I'll, I'll go back and I'll test it in some of the in feed stuff. Um, so there's like lighter areas uh, because the frequency of a 90 day text ad is like, I don't know, 50 or 60. So you, you, you can't have enough text ads. So you can throw a whole bunch of stuff on the wall and see what sticks there and then take that messaging learning and go somewhere else with it. Um, so yeah, multiple feedback loops in trying to get a direct line to the, the actual client um, and their thoughts and feelings instead of just your assumptions. Um, do you guys have a way to validate that? Like one thing that we do with customers, we have this onboarding questionnaire where we, you know, we ask them, what are the main pain points you solve? What are the top reasons why people end up buying from you rather than from a competitor? What are the top reasons why people don't buy from you and instead go to a competitor, right? And they fill this out. No one ever answers, I don't know, yeah. because that will look bad. So they're, they bullshit their way through or they like do some educated guesses. Like yeah. no one will tell you, actually, I don't know what main pain points we solve, or actually, <laughs> I don't know the main reasons why people go with a competitor and not us. So they fill something out. We run with that. And then later it turns out that actually this was like a guess that they made, you know? Yeah. That's, that's a good point. So, I mean, that, that, this honestly could be a whole nother subject about just marketing right. uh, agencies in general and the challenges we face, because all of us choose to focus in a certain niche. And yet we are pretty dependent on a lot of other variables outside of our control for success because i don't i don't touch landing pages usually i don't redo right. brand strategy right. messaging right. I, I don't talk to their clients i don't there's, there's so many things i don't i i don't control 80 percent of their funnel usually i run yeah. linkedin ads and our success is dependent on them having a All lot of other, other crap, stuff. like stuff together 
And so that does suck. And then it's, yeah, do you create systems and frameworks to try to get as much of that? We are moving multi-channel because I do want to own more of the funnel so we, we can it. control more of the results. Um, but then, yeah, I mean, landing pages, brand messaging, like, uh, so for the most part, we do lean on our clients. Uh, we do put that pressure on them and, you know, our best fit clients have that figured out and totally. come to us with really good stuff. And the clients who don't get good results are maybe guessing, or maybe they don't fully know. Um, and yeah, that's not something that we've chosen to try to tackle. Uh, we try to be as helpful as possible, but I have kind of, you know, made up kind of drawn our line in the sand and said, Hey, this is our area of a specialty. There are the variables outside. We can be as helpful as possible, but that kind of is, you know, what it is for now. Um, yeah. All right. And you got, is, got a question. Are the new influencer ads better suited for cold or retargeting? Um, it's a good question. I would say it's, it's based on the content. Um, I would say most, most of the best posts that would be suitable for thought leaders seem to be better in retargeting the stuff where you're just showing, like, it would be better if they had seen you before, before they see that one, unless, you know, in, uh, Finn's example, like if he can go back to the original video that he then made an ad of, if he could have just sponsored that, like, obviously that would have been the best option for him. Um, but not being able to do that. Um, so I would say I'm using them, I'm testing them in cold and in retargeting so far. They're obviously they're getting better results and faster results in retargeting just because I threw a new mix in there into a really warm audience. Um, I haven't had enough time for the cold ones. They're getting really good interactions. The main thing I'm not sure about is, um, because the, the interactions aren't getting sent to a landing page. I, the quality of that first touch, like, do they get the right impression or is it silo? Do I look like a smaller shop because they just saw my personal post and they didn't get exposed mm -hmm. to our brand and the website? I don't know. I suspect that they, they'd probably better be better in retargeting and that you could be making yourself look smaller if you have, if you overly rely on the, the influence mm. or on the influencer ads. Interesting. And so they also, in my mind, maybe shouldn't be a, a big part of the mix. They should be in there, but uh, like an extra touch. But I, I do worry about that too. Cause unless been... you have a lot of people in your company, like Gong who posts amazing content. Yeah. Cause I, I feel like we practice, you know, our version of founder led marketing through me. And that's always been something that I've been, you know, monitoring closely, like how attached should I be to the brand? I do plan like, I plan on making another exit. I sold majority share a couple of years ago. I plan on making another exit. Uh, we're, we are founder led, like, and at hey, what point go. is that, is that, you know, a problem or not? Right. Um, so, but I, you know, I, 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 we're, we're at this point where our next goal post is 10 million ARR. And I still plan on kind of being the face and, and leading founder led marketing to that point. So yeah, I, I think it's, I think it's a good positioning. That's awesome. All right. I have a million more questions, but I want to make sure I respect your time. So All right. you run. This was amazing, Justin. Thank you for your time. If people I don't know you, guys. which is their mistake, go follow him on LinkedIn. All right, guys, this was uh, this was nice. This was fun. I don't know if you guys had fun. Do you guys have fun? Was this like valuable, insightful? Was it too rambly? I know that I interjected myself and we kind of jump from topic to topic. I'm going to do way more of these, um, talking to a bunch of other marketing leaders, founders. Yeah. If you have any feedback, let me know. Then I think we'll, we'll wrap this up unless someone else has some feedback. I'm going to check the LinkedIn live stream. No, looks good here. Cool. All right. Enjoy your Wednesday and I'll see you guys around. Bye. All right. Thank you so much for listening to this episode. If you have any questions, any topics that you would like us to discuss on here, just send me a message on LinkedIn. And uh, thank you so much for listening. Bye-bye. Peace out.